Hi, everyone. My name is Kevin Cunningham, and I am a senior sport management major. On behalf of Elon University, the Department of Sport Management, and the School of Communications, we would like to welcome you to the first annual Sport Management Symposium. Due to the generosity of various contributors, the annual symposium will allow us to address timely and important issues within our industry. Tonight's conversation will be on the legalization of sport betting and, this, and how it will affect the sport landscape, including and not limited to leagues, teams, agencies, and its consumers. Before we begin with our program, we would like to thank Dean Rochelle Ford, the School of Communications, the faculty of the Sport Management Department, and a special thank you to Alyssa Donahue and Tommy Kapetsky for the help in planning the event and executing it as well. At the heart of Elon's mission is a commitment to experiential education, and this event is a perfect example of this. My fellow classmates and I have had the chance to manage this event and work with our faculty in bringing some of the finest leaders in our industry to the campus and including, um, excuse me, including our keynote speaker, former NBA commissioner, David Stern. Mr. Stern was the commissioner of the NBA from 1984 to 2014. During his time as commissioner, he added seven new teams, developed the WNBA, and built the NBA brand into the phenomenon that it is today. Please welcome Mr. Stern and give him a warm Elon welcome. Did you get yeah. an introduction? No, I don't. So uh, I, I'll have to introduce myself. Um, <laughs> but I'm used to that. Okay. Uh, so I'm uh, Bill Squadron, a professor in the sport management department. Uh, and I am uh, also going to join Kevin in welcoming uh, David to Elon. We're very privileged to have him here to talk about sports betting as part of our symposium today. And I'm going to. Um, start off by just asking a question to kind of get things going. And I want everyone to bear in mind, if you have questions, you know, jot them down or keep them in mind because for the last um, 15 minutes of the presentation, we'll open it up to questions from the floor. Uh, you know, for many years, as you're well aware, uh, that all of the sports leagues were vehemently opposed to betting on their games. And uh, your successor, Adam Silver, uh, was really the first uh, leader in the industry to come out uh, in favor of changing the laws. Um, and now, uh, in the wake of the Supreme Court decision, pretty much all of the leagues have embraced it. And you know, my question to you to get things started is really, what was the perspective then, and why has it changed in terms of how the leagues view sports betting? Well. We, uh, when I was a lad, uh, <laughs> sports betting was this horrible thing. And I can remember when uh, Bowie Kuhn, who was then the commissioner of Major League Baseball, said to a uh, minor league team in Las Vegas, you're not allowed to have a sign up or a banner up in the outfield <clears throat> promoting an arena. And the, the evolution of our, each league differently, but our evolution was we didn't used to allow our teams to advertise uh, or have sponsorship with the casinos. Then we said, OK, you can do it for the hotel that's associated with the casino, but you can't say casino. You can just say the win or something like that. And then we said, but you can't show dice or anything or cards. I mean, we were slicing as much as we possibly could. And then finally we said, why bother, you know, go ahead and allow the advertising? It's a state sponsored, state run business, and it's a legitimate business where it where it exists legally. Uh, and that was it. Now, I actually testified in favor of the Professional and Amateur Sports Protection Act, affectionately known as PASPA, which was generated by then Senator Bill Bradley. Um, and by the way, for those of you who might be lawyers, I commend you to reading Justice Alito's uh, decision 
striking it down. As a proud graduate of Columbia Law School, I don't think it was the finest piece of jurisprudence I've ever seen. But that said, strike it down, the Supreme Court did. Uh, read Justice Breyer's dissent, which I think holds a little bit. Or maybe it was concurrence, I can't remember. Uh, but gradually, we moved and moved and moved. And finally, the day that fantasy, daily fantasy, was allowed which I think is just a sophisticated or a different form of sports betting. I threw up my hands and said, I don't understand how we're going to stop the tide, because once you had DraftKings and FanDuel and others, in effect allowing people to bet on that night's games, um, we mel our opposition melted away. And that's all I said to, I, 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 I gave a speech for the American Gaming Association at the convention in Las Vegas, and someone, I said, I don't oppose it now. And someone stood up and said, well, if you don't oppose it now, why are you suing the state of New Jersey to stop them from having betting? And being the loyal Democrat that I am, I said, I don't want Governor Christie in my business. Uh, but I know him pretty well, and we're friendly. and he. When he does something and sees me in the audience, he says, I'll take questions from everyone except Stern. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it, it, was a, it was a process, and we became, and if truth be told, we've had the Summer League, the NBA Summer League, successfully in Las Vegas for many years, and we had our All-Star Game in Las Vegas. So there was no, you know, there was no shame to be attached to Sin City anymore. And our position and the NBA's position, I think, came naturally when my successor, Adam Silver, wrote an op-ed for the New York Times. He didn't clear it with me. <laughs> he doesn't clear anything with me by design. I don't want anything to be cleared with me because uh, he's doing such a great job. And, uh, and then we were, the, the NBA was off and running. And being off and running as a result of that PASPA decision by the Supreme Court really opened the gates for the states each to do what they want, as opposed to a single federal system. And that now being kind of the rule of the day where every state has been free to make its own judgment, take its own approach, how do you feel that's likely well, to play out? Well, I, I was in favor of a federal response. What I think should have happened is the feds should have studied the issue and said, this is the system. You can opt in, you can opt out. States can decide that they want to be in or they don't want to be in. But there should have been a uniform system that had certain safeguards in it, protected the integrity of the leagues, et cetera. Uh, but that was not to be, and I think it's playing out very poorly. Because as a business matter, if you watch what's happening, depending upon, and I don't mean to steal the thunder of whatever panels are later, but if you watch what's happening, uh, every state is different, and it will ultimately be measured by a heat map that shows the intensity of the lobbying by the various industries that are affected by it. So if the casino lobby is big, then you will see, initially at least, until it turns out to be a complete failure, uh, that the uh, sport betting will be only in casinos. Uh, you know, the, the most extreme and the most successful cases in New Jersey where they have it in, you know, FanDuel took over the Meadowlands racetrack and William Hill has a, uh, a betting parlor at Monmouth Racetrack and the casinos in Atlantic City have it. But they also have, you know, digital betting. You can do it on your phone. And I think New Jersey has had about $2 billion bet since it happened. And the other states are being, are woefully underperforming their targets because they're, they're being, becoming pretzels tied in a knot to try to conform their legislation to the various lobbying groups that are out there arguing. It's a, just a microcosm of what's going on at every level of government. The lobbyists are important and they're not asking the citizens and that's too bad in my view. Do you think that um, at some point 
the federal government is likely to look at it and Congress would step in and... Other than a tax cut and Obamacare, I don't think, I can't remember a, leg, a legislative act by this Congress. I used to, I used to, my uh, general counsel used to come running into my office and say to me, David, Senator so-and-so wants us to appear, and I would say, you tell Senator so-and-so, forget about it. And he'd say, David, all right, now you're finished? Okay. You ought to respond to the request, otherwise they're going to issue a subpoena, and they're going to hold you in contempt. But they were only interested in publicity. If you've been down to the House of Representatives, you see, they, you know, Bud was smart. He brought, he brought Hank Aaron, and that was good. They were falling all over him, you know. Uh, and you walk into the hearing room, and they've already had you put piles of paper, which can contain your testimony, so it's there. And all of the representatives pile in, and they each make opening statements denouncing you or whatever it is on drugs, on whatever the issue happens to be. And then slowly the camera turns around to feature those who are testifying. And everyone leaves except the chairman. They all file out. And the chairman asks questions, and we testify to the same thing that's in our paper. And then as then they, the camera is about to turn around, and all the representatives file back in for closing statements. It, it, I mean, our, our citizens should get a chance at it. And I used to say there hasn't been a piece of legislation worthy of us spending our attention on in the last 20 years or so, so why should we bother? But you do, and every time there's something wrong, every time there's a bad call in refereeing, the senators hold a hearing, and every time there's a referee who gets indicted, they hold a hearing, and every time there's drug use, they hold a hearing. Steroid use, they hold a hearing. I mean, it's, the hearings are great because they get you lots of publicity, but never, never have anything substantive come out of that. Yeah. Well, you know, you mentioned a few minutes ago that there was sort of a natural evolution and daily fantasy kind of became the tipping point to um, embrace uh, sports betting as part of the future of the industry, I, are there concerns that leagues should have or issues that, you know, assuming that this is coming, are there certain things that they should be mindful or worried about as they yes, think about it? Yes, uh, there are. Predominant among them, what, what we used to say, what I used to say when I opposed sports betting was that we pulled the NBA from the depths by making fans of our fans. And the idea that Junior, who was brought by his dad to a Knicks game, would leave unhappy because the Knicks won, but they didn't cover, was something that, <laughs> that diminished my appetite, how shall I say it? Uh, but I was worn down by the end, and so let's go. So now, I guess what, what I would say is that as the betters, as the professional betters will tell you, and I think it's clear, information is king with respect to gaming. If you have something that someone else doesn't have, then you have an edge. It may not be a big edge, it may not even be quantifiable, but if you know that player X has this injury or that injury or this mood or that mood, that may be something that you consider actionable. And so I think our players are going to be subject, all players are going to be subject to more scrutiny for a hint. And trainers are going to be subject to more scrutiny for a hint. And maybe even doctors for a hint. And so the price of this, which is I think going to be quite profitable for the leagues, is going to be uh, enhanced vigilance. And I think the leagues are up for it, but it's, it's something that should concern them, does concern them, and they're going to have enhanced security to make sure that they're protecting the assets which they're charged with protecting. How about the way that fans engage with the game? Is that a concern in the sense that, you know, many people think fantasy has changed the way people watch football? because they're more concerned with their fantasy team than they are with their home team. I mean, if, if betting becomes widespread and legal, is that going to change the way f 
fans of the game engage with the game? It certainly holds the prospect or the possibility, if not the certainty, that the discussion will take a different turn in terms of what's tonight's game, what are the odds, what's the over and under on total. I'm sure you don't know what I'm talking about. I have about. no idea no. what you're talking okay. about. <laughs> but the, the easiest bet is to say that uh, each team's, each of the teams is going to project it to score this amount. And you can bet that they will score over that amount or under that amount. That's the over and under bet. And that is a, sort of an interesting thing, which, you know, if someone comes down at the end of the game and their team is winning by 22 points, but, and they take a shot or they don't take a shot that might or might not have a consequence for making the over or the under, they're going to be those that are shouting, shoot, shoot, don't shoot, don't shoot. And whatever the player does, he's going to be damned one way or the other. And so there's going to be a little bit of that at the fringes. Uh, but I think if the leagues are smart, and they are, they'll be able to handle it with their usual aplomb. Well, and that's an interesting scenario, because do you think that you're likely to have higher ratings at the end of those fourth quarter games when they're 25-point blowouts than the you might today? The answer is yes. What's the question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Because if you're on the borderline, even of a blowout, if you're, well, not a blowout, but if there's a, if the over and under is whatever it is, and, you know, and, uh, or even the point, it starts with the point spread, and then it goes to the over and under. And there are going to be some interesting times ahead of us. I remember in the old days, like two years ago or something like that, <laughs> in the old days, Every time a player th at the end of a game threw up an extra shot just for kicks, you know, there was some comment about, oh, my God, it must have been because he bet on the game, which, he, of course, he hadn't. But you run the risk of that. So you're going to have to control it a lot. And uh, there are going to be all kinds of rules. Uh, fortunately, the uh, Las Vegas experience is quite intense in terms of regulation. The KYC, know your customer. You have to know every customer, where his source of funds came from. It's actually, it's like being a regulated like a bank. That's how intense the regulation is in Las Vegas. And I think it's going to creep in here to a lot of the policing of sports betting around the country. A jurisdiction by jurisdiction, my biggest concern was that it depends who the state or what agency the state puts in charge of it. <clears throat> because if you're from New York, those of you who couldn't guess from my accent by now <laughs> where I was from, you would be a little bit cynical about the fact that certain agencies, like forget to send a doctor to a prize fight or don't have adequate medical procedures, or the racing commission allows a jockey to run who's been suspended in another state, things like that. That's why I preferred the idea of federal legislation. Uh, but state by state, it's going to be challenging in terms of running it. But I think the sports leagues have a vested interest in making sure that it runs as close to perfectly as it can and that it doesn't become a place for the governor to put his cousin or whatever it is. Uh, not in New York, of course, but it never happened. But in other states other than New York. Uh, you know, that's, but it's, it's, not gonna, it's not necessarily a walk in the park or a walk on this beautiful campus, which is like a park. You know, in some of the legislative discussions, there's been some consideration of whether the leagues should have approval rights over the kinds of bets offered. I mean, do you, do you think that's an issue? Should the NBA um, have some say over whether you can bet on if Steph Curry is going to score more or less than 12 points in the next six minutes? Yes, because anything that puts the focus on an individual player that is then subject to some discussion after the fact of whether that player you know, can actually 
change the bet or change the success of the odds by a basket or not. Somehow I'm more comfortable with that in the context of a game, but in the context of individual player performance, I think it raises an issue that it'll, uh, it'll be dealt with, but I think the leagues should, in fact, have the ability. I mean, uh, to, to, to say, we don't think a bet is good. If the bet is that the pitcher's going to throw nine curveballs, that's not a good, that's not something that baseball should want because that's in the control of the pitcher, and that's something that is subject to uh, certain commentary that might or might not be entirely favorable. Now, what about college sports? We're here on a campus. Should oh. that be treated differently than professional sports when it comes to sports betting? You know... You said I could ask you anything. You can. <laughs> you can. I... You know, it's, it's kind of interesting. A lot of the legislation that's coming up is saying that you're not allowed to bet on sports. Some of it is ridiculous. In New Jersey, I don't remember exactly, but you're like, you can't bet on in-state institutions. So therefore, you can't bet on Rutgers and Princeton and Ryder College and Montclair State University. But you can bet on Whittier versus Ohio State, just to name two diverse campuses. Uh, I don't know how it's going to be avoided. I mean, once you catch the bug, the biggest bet in Britain these days is on the gender of uh, the baby of the royal family. Okay? I mean, they're betting huge amounts of dollars. Bookie, once bookies are recognized as legitimate purveyors of a product, it gets crazy. And, I, and I'm, you know, I, 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 colleges have a problem. I've have a, I had a fair amount of experience with that uh, from my background as a lawyer and my understanding of what is possible at the college level because some of the greatest scandals or potential scandals came long before most, long, long before most people in this room were born. Uh, 1950, was uh, City College and LIU and, you know, some famed teams were uh, shaving points. And so I don't know what the answer is, but there has, and, and the coaches were or were not looking away from the issue. And I'll leave it at that. I don't want to get in too much trouble today. But uh, I, I think that college kids can be more easily influenced especially in potentially corrupt cultures which are more prevalent and exploitive on the college level than they are in the pros. Now I've said it. But you know, often people will say that Come on, don't you have a follow-up? I am asking you a follow-up. Right. I'm absolutely asking you a follow-up. Okay. Because often people will say that there's so much betting on college and professional sports that takes place today on the black market with offshore, you know, offshore based websites and so forth, I mean, hundreds of billions of dollars in many estimates, that in, you're fact, in right. fact, you're going to improve the potential of protection I, by bringing it above board. I think that is so. I think that bringing it out of the shadows and making it legal will put dollars in the coffers of the state and out of the hands of organized crime because the numbers are quite astounding and the betting is taking place, as we know, offshore where people are betting, quote, illegally because you're not allowed to bet offshore if you're in the U.S. or a U.S. citizen, I guess. Uh, and that, that, uh, there is that. And there are, there are services like Genius Sport and... Uh, uh, Sport Radar and Perform that both deliver odds and services but also have the ability to track any unusual movement in betting with very high-tech speed that's as fast as anything you've seen that tr moves stock prices uh, over, you know, the Flash Boys or whatever the, uh, the particular technology has to be. So there is that protection, and it's going to be out in the sunlight 
and that's a good thing. I think it's a fair point that the coverage is going to be more focused on, sp on sports betting than it has been, and therefore fans, young fans, are going to be more knowledgeable about sports betting as they grow up. Is that good? Is that bad? I leave it to the history to decide that. But it's going to get to be a thing. You know, you know, every network, ESPN, ESPN+, Plus, Fox Sports, et cetera, Bleacher Report, they now have a sports betting show of some type. If you go to uh, Las Vegas, you can see Brent Musburger in his retirement at the at VSIN, appropriately named Vegas Sports and Information Network. Uh, I was supposed to appear on that during the Consumer Electronics Show, but because of a family illness, I wasn't able to be in Las Vegas. But if Brent calls you, you know, you go visit with an old friend. And that's being grouped with some other programming. And so you're going to see a lot of sports betting programming. A lot of interest is going to in that. And no one's going to say, tonight, the Red Sox and the Yankees are playing a series. They're going to say and the Yankees are favored to win two out of the three, or the Red Sox are favored to win two out of three, and the odds on the World Series are this or that. And people will become aware of what bets are. And it's going to be good at a certain level because it's going to create a lot more interest than there currently is. It's going to raise television ratings and going to raise sponsorship dollars so it's good for the sports, it's good for the teams, and the way most leagues have structured their collective bargaining agreements, it's good for the players, because in the NBA, the players get 50% off the top, and it's just similar to the NHL, similar to the NFL, we're all around, anything from 47 to 51 or something like that. So the players will get their share too, and there'll be all kinds of new endorsement deals and all kinds of sponsorship opportunities. So it's good for business. Jersey logos. Yes. Well, I mean, you see them all over the UK, right, on soccer? On yeah, soccer. no, and the NBA has had Jersey logos uh, for a couple of years. They just extended them for a three more year try. And the estimate, although I, I, I guess I read the, I'm a sports junkie, in case you haven't noticed, and I read the Sports Business Journal and the Sports Business Daily and uh, hashtag sports and sports techie and synopsis sports, you name it, I read it. So I have more meaningless information <laughs> at a very superficial level than anyone you know. Uh, but I read someplace, so it must be true if I read it, that the NBA was getting making $150 million a year from logos and that uh, Commissioner Silver had projected that they might make 100. So they're running ahead. Every team has a logo. Of course, it's nothing compared to European soccer, where you don't, can't even find out the name of the team. It's just Emirates. I don't know. I forget which team they sponsor, but they're just all across the uniform. You can't even find out who it is. And that's taken over, and we can lament that, but that's just a fact of life, and that's where it's all heading. You know, you mentioned the media shows. Um, do you see the emergence of sports betting affecting the live <coughs> broadcast as well? Of course. Of course. I mean, because, you know, it's going to all, they're all going to tiptoe around it until they don't anymore. And it's going to say, okay, in tonight's game, the Knicks, well, I don't want to, <laughs> that's hopeless. <laughs> the Knicks, <laughs> tonight's game, Team X, is, uh, is favored by five points. The thing that always strikes me is how accurate the odds makers are. It's really extraordinary. When you're watching a playoff game in the NFL, you know, at the end of the game, they're within two points of having projected a win. I don't know how they do it. You know, it's, it's quite remarkable. But I think that once that's a fact and once it's all out there in the open, of course, some network is going to go and say tonight's game is projected to be a three-and-a-half-point game. And guess what? When it's down to a basket at the end and it's a two-point game, the next basket either puts them over or, or puts them under, 
the spread, there's going to be commentary on that. That's just the way it's going to be. And you don't think, do you think that's a bad thing, or you think that's just the way it's going to be? I refuse to answer on yeah. the grounds that it might incriminate me. <laughs> All right. And I'm still something called a senior advisor to the NBA. <laughs> well, uh, I think it's great for business. I think it has its risks and its issues. But I think the leagues will get past it in a good way. We're going to open this up to questions in one second. I have one last question to ask you more sort of broadly. You know, this is going to be a, um, you know, a process over a number of years. But as you look down the road, how do you see this change impacting? We know in England, people bet on third division Italian volleyball. I mean, they bet on everything. Are we heading toward that 10 years from now? Well, you know, I watched, I'm a big tennis fan. And I watched a set where Davidenko, who was like a fourth ranked player, uh, there was a lot of movement, a lot of money came in. And just after the money came in, he retired because he was injured. Now, I, I, I and, and the money was bet against him. It didn't come in for him. And there has been a lot of bad history in, you know, make it up, Bulgarian soccer. There has been, you know, and so you have to be very careful uh, and policing it. That's why the, comp, you know, the, 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 the leagues are going to have their current version of sports Interpol, and the trafficking and betting is going to be carefully watched by the, <coughs> excuse me, the internet betting companies like Genius, Sport Radar, and Perform. Uh, but yes, there will be, it will reach down into all segments of sports. It is now coming out of the European experience. So we can take a few questions. Um, I don't know if we have people with mics, or you can just speak up. But uh, there's a yep, gentleman there's with a jacket on. Someone back here. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Stern. Uh, my name is Christian Harrison. I'm actually a second year law student at Elon's Law School. It's in Greensboro. So uh, thank you for having us. Thank you, Christian. Um, my question is, um, a few weeks ago, I was in Washington, D.C., listening to a man named Joe Briggs. He does um, legal work for the NFL. And he mentioned that um, the stadiums might include like consoles for live betting in-game. Have there been any talks about that um, in the NBA or any other leagues that you know about? Yeah, actually, you can go to Giant Stadium and bet on your cell phone of a Giants game this past season with FanDuel. So whatever the talk may be, it ain't happening right now. Uh, and I understand that in Washington, D.C., which is completely screwed up with Inarita betting and I don't know what, not on federal land, and then they gave the Lottery Commission part of the action. I mean, you're... It's a great experience for watchers of government. You can see how this country is running these days. Uh, it's, I think that I saw Ted Leonsis, uh, who owns the Capitals and the uh, Wizards. I have to stop myself from saying the bullets. The Wizards, uh, I'm locked in another time. Uh, he's going to own a sports bar adjacent to the building and have it and have betting right there. So I think it's happening. I think it's, there's going to be on-premises betting. Because the interesting thing is going to be, once you allow it to be digital, and given the wiring of our buildings to accede to the demands of our fans who want to have a second screen experience, whether it be highlights or chat, it's going to allow sports betting in arena as well. Um, so I, I remember, um, or I know that a couple of years ago, I guess back in the early 2000s or even 90s maybe, um, there was that big scandal with um, the NBA ref who was pressured and threatened by an organized crime group to fix games. And I know he was put on trial for that and all that stuff. And those kind of scandals have been going on really since, you know, shoeless Joe Jackson and Pete Rose. And my question is kind of do you think with the legalization of sports betting that we're going to see the, more of those types of scandals happen, and what do you think the league should do to protect the integrity of the games? 
I don't see it happening more, but it's a, it's a real problem. I do a little bit of consulting on crisis, and I tell my client, you don't have a crisis here. A crisis is when the FBI comes into your office to tell you that a referee is betting on games that he's working. <laughs> that is a crisis. <laughs> OK? It's, not, it's funny, but it's not funny. Uh, and I, I just think that it's been happening in certain ways. Corruption is corruption. And you're, it's going to continue. You, you know, every time there's a lawsuit in a business where they say, oh, my God, it's, it, how could the accountants not know? We'll sue the accountants, too. The accountants, it's hard to find somebody who's committing fraud and corrupt. And it's going to happen, whether, whether it's legal uh, betting or illegal betting, the risk is still the same. And I think that the legalization of it, in some respects, is going to make the leagues more vigilant and more sensitive. You know, there's an issue, for example, on such a thing as an over and under. If you know that the shot clock operator or the operator of the game clock is slow or fast, you can make a considered judgment about whether the game is going to be shorter or longer. That's why, some years ago, we put in an apparatus, talk about technology, where the referee starts the clock and shuts the clock off over here on his belt. Uh, so it doesn't depend upon the speed with which the shot, the, the, the game clock operator hits the button or not. And those are the kinds of things that sports leagues are going to do. And it's going to get much more sophisticated. And technology is going to be the friend of the detection unit, in my view. Question here. My God, all the questions are grouped in one area. That's a very productive area. <laughs> I think you, you've talked a lot about the conversation um, to make sure that the relationship between the gambling and the leagues, the, the, the state of play, is fair. Um, but a lot of, if you, if you look at betting in European sports leagues, it all comes slapped with a, a be gamble aware, and they're, and they're trying to be vigilant about uh, gambling addiction. Is there any talk about how to do? sports betting ethically uh, in terms of the relationship between gambling and the bettors? There's going to have to be. There are organizations that actually oppose this because of the potential of sports addiction. There's one gentleman who you, I used to interface with regularly. Um, and I think we're going to have to devote some very substantial resources you know, it, it's the problem is it's a lot like don't drink and drive. The beer companies are big sports sponsors, and some percentage of their advertising is a good friend doesn't let a good friend drive. There's going to have to be something that's equivalent or more with respect to the possibility of sports gambling addiction because it's out there. The addiction of betting, I know, you know, people that bet on lotteries uh, and are addicted to it. They, I was, I'm sitting in a, I shouldn't say this, I was in a liquor store in, Beth, in Vermont. And someone comes in who was obviously a regular and says, OK, Joe, give me 20. And all of a sudden, the, the machine starts popping out. It's clear that this person comes in from time to time and regularly bets $22 bets. I don't know exactly what the amount was. It was more than a dollar. And that's a little bit of an addiction, I think. Not a, more, not a little bit. That is an addiction. And you have addicted people betting lotteries now as well. Uh, I think that sports has the capacity to shine a light on that and be constructive about it because it's, uh, it happens throughout society, which happens to be another lecture that I give on sports and social responsibility. And I think you should hold be harsh in your judgments of sports leagues if they don't do what you suggest they should do. Do you think that conversation can happen with other people who I know? Yes, I think so. I think they're quite aware of what has to be done. Well, they're quite aware of the issue, and they have to address it exactly. The precise means is, uh, I think, is up in the air right now. There are very few states that currently have legal betting. And if you can figure it, and, and all of the projections, except in New Jersey, have not been met by a large measure. Um, in Mississippi, in Rhode Island, in West Virginia, 
I can't remember where else, but it's, uh, uh, but it's, it's going to get uncorked, so to speak, and it's going to pick up steam. And I think the sports leagues are up to the task of taking care of the issue that you raise. I think we have time for one or two more. Yep. So with like spreads and over the recently emerged of like the end of games, do you think particularly a sport like the NBA where a lot of runs are called or they're just subjective, do you think speed play is like maybe enhanced because of that? Yes, I think that end of game, well, the good news there, we were helped a lot by the non-call in the New Orleans game, yeah. okay? <laughs> You know, it's every commissioner's lament. You know, we got six refs standing looking exactly at the play and they miss it. And believe it or not, it happens. They're all given directions to look here, look there, and, and the problem with refereeing, as I always said, is we're dealing with humans, so they're less than perfect. But the answer is there's going to be more and more of a demand and a response to making sure the refs got it right, because there's a large percentage of calls that are not right. And just to acknowledge them after the fact doesn't do anything. So I think it's going to lead to enhanced replay opportunities and demands by fans to have more replay opportunities. One more. Yeah. Um, my name is Ethan Gould, and I'm a senior here in the sport management department. Um, I have two questions. The first is if gambling gets legalized across the country, especially in collegiate athletics, do you think that will change the discussion of whether college athletes should be paid for their likeliness? Um, and the second is, as someone who's unemployed and also a lot of underclassmen here, what would be your career advice to help them get to where they want to be today? I think that the demand for, uh, it's interesting, because there's the O'Bannon case where players have to be paid for their likenesses and actually, there are some sports betting cases where players objected, and the courts have sort of indicated that they don't have to be compensated for using their likenesses in betting. But I think to, I connect it back. Uh, the, the pressure is going to be intense to increase the compensation to players. I don't know whether there's going to be an overarching statement that the cost of attendance includes additional payments, but I think that's coming. And what I don't think you can have is colleges flat out competing on salary for players. Because I could tell you already that the ACC and the Big Ten win, and everyone else loses. Uh, and that, that's sort of what's gonna, that's gonna wind up being the first nail in the coffin of college sports. But, but unfortunately, there's been a, a serious, how can it, how's it possible that scholarship players were literally deprived of the means of having their parents come to watch them play? It's, it comes from a ludicrous position. And don't get me started on the NCAA, because that's a whole other discussion, which is now being revealed in terms of the money that's paid to athletes to attend certain schools that the coaches know nothing about. Uh, but they're, but they're competent to earn $10 million a year. How do you not loosen the strings to let those kids earn more money, and especially if they're enriching the school and the NCAA and the coaches and everything else? Oh, God, I don't know what to tell you. It's the, you know, on number two, I always read everything. I always stayed ready to jump at any opportunity that I could find. And there's a whole lot of things happening. And it's sports and sports related. You know, if you think about the way that sports now interfaces, you have to be an immigration lawyer to deal with the influx of players who are playing. You have to be an intellectual property lawyer to be able to protect the rights of the league. You have to be an antitrust lawyer. And you can't be all of those things. Uh, and, and the same is true with respect to television. You have to know everything about TV production, but you also have to know about over-the-top streaming, technology advances, you know, the fact that you can choose the, the announcers that you want, choose the feed that you want, get the sports line that you want. And it's, it's changing so much every day that all I can say is stay on top of it, and then you'll catch the merry-go-round's going to come around, and you'll grab your 
course, and you'll be surprised as long as you know a lot, and it pays to keep learning. That's so, it. On that very positive note, we're going to have to wrap up. Um, thank you. And we have a great panel coming up next, Taylor.